Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Welcome back to this episode of the Ultimate Ramadan series. What we're going to go over in this episode is how to have the ideal iftar and suhoor. Now, when it comes to nutrition and what to eat, there's a lot of debate online. Everyone's disagreeing. People are saying carnivore. People are saying vegan. There's disagreement across the board on what human beings should be eating. Some of that's nefarious and some of that is just confusion about different um, data points. What we want to give you here is general rules and heuristics, uh, protocols for you to, um, to fit into your life and see what works for you at Suhoor. Ideally, what we want to do is provide you with the different tips, tricks, heuristics to help you optimize your Suhoor based on your cultural norms, based on what your family does, so that you can have an ideal Suhoor that gives you enough energy throughout the day, that you have a proper iftar that's not making you feel sluggish and not allowing you to get to the majid for tarawih, um, and overall having a more healthy uh, lifestyle and healthier um, relationship with food during the month of Ramadan. So let's just jump right into suhoor to start that off. Now, suhoor is an essential aspect of the month of Ramadan. It's what we are known to do. We wake up early to eat before the fast. Um, and this is an emphasized um, sunnah. And um, the Prophet Muhammad said, take suhoor for, for rarely there is a barakah, there's a blessing in that meal. So we don't want to avoid that meal, especially because there's that emphasis in um, there's an the emphasis on that to have the blessing in the meal. So skipping suhoor is a bad idea. It's bad from a hydration perspective. It's a go- bad from a having energy throughout the day perspective. Um, some people try to skip suhoor to lose weight. That's not going to be conducive to weight loss, but we'll cover weight loss in the next section. So my goals at suhoor are threefold. Um, to have optimal hydration, and we can you can reference the hydration section to kind of go over that in more detail. To replenish liver and muscle glycogen, to have those um, carbohydrates in the form of glycogen, um, simple glucose stored in my muscles, stored in my liver to help me get throughout the day. And to have sufficient fuel um, to give me energy levels for my brain, for my heart, to keep pumping, to do all these things so I can have um, energy throughout the day. Now, during Ramadan, I'm doing long hospital shifts that can range from 12 hours all the way up to 24 hours. So I need to have the optimal meals to get me through the day. Now, you're probably going to eat what your family eats, what's culturally appropriate for you. But we can kind of give you guidelines to help tailor that for a more optimal perspective. So what I would tell people at Suhoor, uh, is to have a good ratio of proteins, carbs, and fat. The protein is important because protein is the most satiating of those three. It can give you, keep you full, keep you energetic, additionally help you keep that muscle uh, mass. You don't want to be losing any muscle mass during Ramadan. And we'll t- cover that more in the muscle building section. Um, secondly, you want some fats. Fats have more calories per gram compared to any of the other three macronutrients. Fats have more calories per gram than any of the other three macronutrients, and they can kind of give you more burning energy throughout the day. And carbohydrates are very important because carbohydrates are what give you that um, carb glucose source to replenish that muscle and liver glycogen. Additionally, the hydrate in carbohydrates is important because that's how you um, can uptake more water through um in taking the right ratio of salt, water, and carbs, like we talked about in the hydration section. So for people um, to have a suhoor, what I would say is something like Greek yogurt with some honey, kefir with honey. Um, it's rich in protein. It has the fats. It has the carbohydrates. It has all those things. Eggs, date, and other types of fruit that are fast burning and, and um, can give energy for somebody who's going to stay up right after suhoor. Um, some people like oatmeal because that's more of a slow digestive carb. So you can kind of give you more energy throughout the day. Just like you have that slow release caffeine, you can have that slow release carbohydrate in the form of oatmeal. Um, overall, you want to tailor that to your um, cultural preferences, to your dietary preferences. But for me, my suhoor usually is some kind of dairy source because dairy is um, more hydrating of a food. Um, some kind of easy burning carbohydrate, honey, fruit, whatever it may be. Some electrolytes, whether that's just salt on on the honey on, on the yogurt or actual electrolyte packet, that will help me have optimal glycogen, optimal energy throughout the day, and um, keeping me well hydrated. So overall, what I would say for suhoor, my guidelines are: don't skip suhoor. That'd be a big mistake. Optimize your hydration and refer back to the hydration section for that. A healthy combination of fats, carbs, and proteins. Replenish your glycogen by consuming easy digest um, carbohydrates like fruits, honey, those kind of things. Avoid overdoing the salt intake because if you do too much salt, you'll feel more thirsty throughout the day. Uh, and this will increase your thirst. And eating to satiation so you feel well-nourished and you don't feel over-nourished. You don't want to overdo it at suhoor either. 
so you have enough energy to get throughout the day and not eating junk processed food. Those processed foods are going to sit in your stomach all day. They're going to make you feel terrible and feel miserable. So you want to fuel with unprocessed foods that are healthy, that are good for you. And you know very well what feels the best when you eat it and what feels bad. Now, going on to iflad. So we've all been there. It's 10 minutes after iflad and we're sitting in a severe food coma. What we want to avoid is the bad relationship that comes with food at iflad. We're hungry all day while we're fasting and suddenly we hit iflad and we binge eat like crazy and kind of undo a lot of the beneficial aspects of the fast. That's actually remarkable here is that I've seen people gain weight in the month of Ramadan because they have such a poor relationship with food. They're binge eating. They're having lavish spreads at different parties during the month of Ramadan. And when I tell my friends that don't fast in Ramadan, like my uh, my coworkers, I tell them that, yeah, the, the people actually don't lose <laughs> that much weight during the month. They actually end up gaining weight. Ideally, if you are doing Ramadan properly, you should be coming out of the month leaner, healthier, feeling better. Your blood pressure is better. Your blood sugar is better. All these things are improved. But unfortunately, because of our poor dietary choices or poor sleep choices, we end up with the opposite effect. So what I would say when it comes to iflad is you don't want to be an extremist and try to avoid all the great foods that are put out culturally from your family, whatever it may be. At the same time, you don't want to um, get into a food coma. So number one, what we want to cover is how to avoid a food coma at iflad. And what I found very effective for people is to hack into your satiation system. So what you should do is you break your fast at iflad um, with water, dates, um, something light, like a soup or something like that. And then instead of going right into your meal, you should pray Maghrib immediately after iflad. What this does is there's a delay when it, for the signal of the food entering your stomach to hit your brain and to, for your brain to feel that you're satiated. So when you eat a little bit, you pray Maghrib, you go back to the dinner table and eat. Now you're coming in, you're more calm, you're not feeling that desire to binge eat on everything you see. And you can kind of eat your meal at your own pace and enjoy the food. So what you want to do is then eat and not reach fullness. You don't want to overfill your stomach. You're just going to feel miserable. You're going to have digestive issues from going 12, 16 hours of not eating at all to suddenly putting down 3,000 calories in a 15-minute window, um, like some kind of mukbang video online. Um, you can always go back and eat more, but you don't want to overdo it at iflad and you don't want to ruin your ability to go to tarawih, to pray tajr, to pray tarawih, whatever it may be, because of that. So some guidelines, what I would say for uh, the iftar meal itself is you want to avoid foods that give you GI upset, that give you gastro, gastrointestinal problems. You don't want to eat foods that are very oily. I know everyone has their version of some kind of samosa, whatever it may be, some kind of oily fried food. Some of that, of course, you're not going to avoid it at all, but you don't want to overdo those things, have those oils sitting in your stomach while you're praying to the You end up burping to the person to the right of you, to the left of you, and ruining the experience for everyone else. Um, what you want to do is eat foods that are easy to digest. You want to focus on eating higher amount of protein. Like we said, protein will help um, be satiating um, for you and to help you not go uh, and binge eat. And what I tell people is that during the month of Ramadan, you want to use the month as a training wheels to fix your relationship with food so you can go out of the month and have a better relationship with food instead of having um, binge eating problems during the month. So my thought of guidelines are, of course, don't binge eat using the protocol we talked about, eat enough protein, eat what's culturally appropriate for you and what, what your family's uh, eating, but in a balanced matter, while focusing on whole foods that are unprocessed, not stuff that comes out of a box, unprocessed foods that don't need a wrapper, don't need a, a nutritional label. Um, and then you want to uh, avoid overeating or undereating. Some people try to starve themselves on Ramadan to lose weight, but then they end up making the fast uh, that more challenging. And you want to overeat so that you can um, barely get off the couch after the meal. Additionally, I would say if you want to avoid eating foods that make you feel bad as this will negatively affect your ability to worship, ability to go to the masjid, ability to read Quran, whatever it may be. If you enjoy the tips and tricks we talked about today for Iftar Saud, please check out the Ultimate Amman ebook link below for more in-depth look at all these different topics.